Hi, fans of high quality entertainment. Uh, this is Jean Pow Barabajaggle, and uh, I'm doing a video for Larry Graves, the Canadian Stud Muffins contest. Um, this is a part one of a two part video because I know my video entry will be long. That's how I am. Um, and it's very lo fi video. Here is me on a cell phone in my bedroom with a bunch of records. And that's what you get, me blabbing away. So without further ado, I've got my spark shirt on. I'm ready to rumble. Okay, um, I'm not gonna do sparks, but if I did sparks, I would agree with Larry and pick uh, Angst in My Pants as number one. I would disagree, however, on having um, Hello, Young Lovers is the worst cover. I'd probably pick Balls, because it's just kind of like a ball, which is fine. Not really a problem. I mean, interior design, but I like interior design. And music you can dance to, but I still it's still a picture of them. So, I don't know. They've all, they're all good covers. I'm not really going to be mad at Sparks. <laughs> You know, if I was going to pick one, it might be Steady Drip, 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 because it's kind of the same joke that they've done before as far as, um, oh, uh, in outer space where Ron's being hit by the pie and Russell isn't, it's Ron's getting drips on him and Russell isn't, you know, Russell's waterproof, whatever. So, but this is not about sparks. This is about other artists that I'm trying to highlight because, you know, Larry was implying to pick people that you're passionate about, and I always like to do that. So, I'm going to start off with The Who. Um, the first band I got into was The Beatles, but pretty much hot on the heels of The Beatles, I got into The Stones, and then I got into The Who, and I really got into The Who. I kind of, as a kid, was really into the whole mod thing, um, you know, like the Quadrophenia album and the Quadrophenia movie, and got into the jam and kind of the neo-mod movement as much as I could follow it from a rural town in Washington. So it was my um, quest to get a copy of their first album that had the British cover because I thought that was such a cool cover. And it is. You know, it's this above shot. They all, um, you know, look have rather pop art, Carnaby Street-ish threads. Um, John Entwistle has the famous uh, Union Jack jacket that usually you see Pete Townsend in. Pete has a scarf, and they just look really cool. Now... The back looks cool too, very 60s graphics with good pictures of them live. Um, this was the US cover, which I was not a fan of. Uh, it just doesn't have the same kind of vibe to it. And you get the, the uh, Big Ben in the background, Houses of Parliament. But that's, that's not the same as that front cover. That front cover is just awesome. So that's my favorite cover. My least favorite cover. Well, even though I was into the whole mod thing, this is their most recent studio album, and it's such a, I don't know, here it is. I mean, yeah, this is the whole pop art graphic thing, and if anybody should have a pop art graphic thing going on, it's The Who, and they've got Chuck Berry on there, and they've got a This Guitar Has Seconds to Live old advertisement that I used to love and all that, and the Roundel and a thing with Detour on it when their band was originally called The Detours. But eh, what is this? This is ugly. This is just boring. Because... What's the name of the album? The album on the side says Who Heart I. I love the Who backwards. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's like this album cover has made me not play this album. 
And that's a really bad thing as far as being a fan. You know, you're supposed to be inspired to play an album because of the cover. You think that, oh, this is cool. I want to check this out instead of, oh, that cover's so bad, I won't even put it in my player. So I don't know. You know, I saw this tour. It was a good tour. The couple of new songs I heard were decent at the time. I've long forgotten them, and I don't play that album. Now, I played The Endless Wire a lot more, but still, I have the same issue with this cover because it's just kind of Tommy graphics that have been remixed, you know? I mean, it folds out and it has a lot of the Tommy look to it, kind of, with the booklet. And it's a good enough album. I really liked some of it at the time. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but I like kind of the sweet thing they had going on that they played all of live on that show, because I've seen The Who a lot. I, I tend to go see them most of the time, though I don't think I'm going this next time, because it's a lot of money. Um, over and over and over again. So yeah, that's that's my feelings on their two most more recent albums. The graphics put me off because they're just kind of rehashes. Uh, okay, so let's get off that depressing subject and go on to Patty Smith. Patty Smith's horses, I think, is just one of the greatest portrait album covers ever. She looks so cool to me. You know. This is just, uh, to me, um, that photo intrigued me about her so much it got me into her career. Um, it's a photo by Robert Maplethorpe. Before he was well known, they had a relationship early on uh, in her career, and he continued to photograph her for album covers. All the great Patti Smith covers from the 70s were done uh, by Robert, and, you know, I love that album. Um, it's not actually not my favorite Patti album. I would say probably Radio Ethiopia is, um, but all those, th those first four albums are great. So this is my legacy edition of Horses. And it's nice because it has other Robert photos in it. These radiator photos I really like. Um, and it has the album plus uh, a live uh, sh horses show from 2005 in London. And I saw the show at the Crocodile Cafe in Seattle. So... Horses, horses, horses. Got to meet Lenny Kay then, too, and he was super nice to me. Lenny Kay is awesome. I've never actually met Patty, but I always kind of worry about meeting Patty because Patty's kind of moody. If you catch her on a good day, she's charismatic as hell. If you say the wrong thing, she can not always be that nice. So, you know, I don't need to be, meet Patty. I've got her autograph. Um... So my least favorite Patti Smith cover is The Dream of Life, which I feel bad about saying I don't really like this cover. I associate it with being disappointed when it came out. It's got real 80s production. I didn't think it was up to snuff compared with the four albums she did in the 70s. I've gotten to like it a bit more, but it's never the one I'll play. Um, I like People Have the Power. I liked it when it came out, too. But this photo is important to her because this is, like, the last session that she did with Robert. So I understand that that's really important to her. However, it kind of shows in her face that she seems kind of worried, pensive. You know, it's not this Patty. This is a very defiant Patty, and this is a, you know, kind of washed out, you know, it seems sad. And I also, also thought she used to look like Lily Tomlin on this, and to me that just, it's not a representative photo 
of the patty I think of. But, you know, everybody looks different at different times. So, and I have a lot of her other albums, but the 70s albums are kind of my favorites. I think most people tend to agree with that. Okay, we're going to roll on here. So, I think a lot of people who know me know one of my favorite bands of all time is the New Rhythm and Blues Quartet, NRBQ. Um, NRBQ aren't always that well known, so I was going to show a couple albums as well as my favorite and least favorite. Um, so, my favorite NRBQ album, I'm going to show not right away, but their most e iconic cover would be Scraps. Unfortunately, I don't have the LP of Scraps here, so this isn't quite the same. It's kind of, oh, sorry about the reflection. It's Terry's Shoes, and this is too close of a photo but they're multicolored shoes against a dark background and they're all worn out and that was their third album i think that's a fantastic cover i really like the cover of workshop as well because it really shows the personalities of the band they're they've got a real sense of humor and these are like four guys who probably shouldn't be in a workshop like ever because they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so this is more like workshop class or something. Terry's there with a saw and a hammer and Al has a big long uh, screwdriver thing and there's just like a nail down here. So it's like totally pointless. And then Joey has a planer and... I think this is uh, Tom Staley. He's got an oil can. <laughs> and then there's little blocks at the bottom that say NRBQ. And it says, I think, something like, you've been deceived up here on the wall. So this is a great cover, but it's not the one I'm picking. The one I'm picking is this one. At Yankee Stadium. So most people would think, at Yankee Stadium, NRBQ, this is a live album. It's not a live album. It's not a live album at all. It's a studio album. So Yankee Stadium here is empty. It's like totally empty. Can't be a live album. Nobody's there. Oh, wait a second. Way down here. Wait, wait, where are they? Oh, right, right down here. There's like three guys. There, no, four guys. There's the band. The, the band sitting down there. What? Well, I better get out the binoculars and look at them through the binoculars. Oh, there they are. They're sitting in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> I think that's funny. Anyway, this is one of their best albums. This is one of the albums you should get if you want an introduction to NRBQ, because this is just solid. Uh, it was on Mercury. It's from 1978. Um, that would make it, I think, their, is it their fifth album? Um, they, like Sparks, would go from label to label and not have success and get dumped. So there were periods of time where they were without a label for about five years in the 80s. Um, yeah, but this is, this is one of those should have been a huge hit albums that wasn't. And it was on Mercury, so great album. It's one of their most straight ahead albums. After that, I think they kind of gave up in a way and just decided to do whatever they wanted. And there are some wacky albums after that, let me tell you, which some of them are my favorites. Okay, so least favorite in RBQ cover. And you've got some bad ones. <laughs> Rob, my friend Rob's uh, least favorite is Tiddlywinks. I don't have Tiddlywinks here, but it's like a little cutout picture of a dog in a room, and it looks really corny. It looks like a little kid did it. Very, they, they were good for kind of little kid graphics. I think Terry did them. But this is my least favorite cover. NRBQ, Message for the Message. And the title's not that great either. So I guess it's the message because you see 
you know, the power lines up here and there's writing in the sand. So that's like a message and there's like graffiti. Oh yeah, that's like a message, I guess. And the typeface on the back is really ugly and you get a tiny picture of them. <sighs> this isn't the worst album. This is a pretty good album, honestly. It's a little scattershot, but there's some really good Big Al songs. And this was Big Al's last album. Al Anderson left after this album which was too bad, but it probably saved his life because I know he needed to quit the band and quit touring to deal with his alcoholism. And he kind of has had a good um, songwriter career in Nashville since then with uh, Vince Gill and some other people. But I will say about this album cover and this album, me and my friend Rob, this has been the fodder for a million jokes. Everything we do, it's like, oh, message for the message. Oh, okay, storage for the storage, or porridge for the porridge when you're eating oatmeal. Or, you know, you do anything, you can apply that to phrase to, like, everything. It's great. I don't know. Some people's sense of humor. That's my sense of humor. Okay. I mean, other good NRBQ. Uh, this is another bad one. That's of my band. That's from a video where they're all dressed up like guys making pizza. They're making pizza. That's when, uh, other than Terry Adams, who's on the cover, um, everybody in the band was an Italian. So that's of my band. They're all making pizza in a video. You know, that's a, not a great album. <laughs> and... I love this cover, though. I said they kind of do simple, childlike graphics sometimes. Kick me hard. NRBQ. Really great album. Recommend that one, too. Okay, we've done enough with NRBQ. Next, we're going to The Replacements. So The Replacements were from Minneapolis, um, I think some people out there know who they were, but they were kind of, they started off a, a punk rock band in Minneapolis and uh, gradually kind of turned into an indie pop band in the 80s and made some really great albums. But another one of those bands where they wanted to do it their way and sometimes that meant totally destroying their potential for commercial success. And I love them for it, but it was kind of sad in a way. So um, I first got into them with the Please to Meet Me album, but when I went back and got albums, I think for a cover, my favorite LP cover they did was Hoot Nanny, just because I really like the graphics. And I later found out that the graphics on this were designed by Grant Hart, the drummer from Husker Du. He did all the covers for Husker Du, and he did some other people's album covers as well. And this comes from this LP, which is a 1960s folk compilation. You know, it has like the limelighters and different um, folk artists on it. So, as you can tell, Grant copied it pretty closely, but used all the replacement song titles. And they have a song called Hoot Nanny on it. That, that, I will say that is not the best replacements album. Don't start with that one if you're interested in the band. It's practically an EP as far as good songs and a whole lot of songs where they're just screwing around. You know, there's a couple cool old-fashioned punk songs on it, but then there's really great stuff like um, Color Me Impressed, uh, willpower within your reach, you know, it's just mixed in with some kind of garbage. I love love lines, though. I love take me down to the hospital, but then there's things like Mr. Whirly and uh, Hoot Nanny that are funny like once. So, so not their best album, but it's promising. It's one of those that they were changing into a great band. This album is fantastic. However, it has one of the worst covers possible, and that is the album Tim. And they named it Tim because, you know, that's what they were doing at the time. They were just being obnoxious. Let's call it Tim. 
So it's a picture of Bob Stinson's face upside down. Then you've got Tommy Stinson with his bass and uh, Westerberg and Chris Mars. It's just kind of blurry, weird photos on the top in pink in this weird, dark cement hallway. And on the back, just some ugly, clashing graphics. And that's all you get. And the videos to this were almost just as ridiculous because it was just the picture of a, a video of a stereo being played while they, you know, played the song because they didn't want to do a rock video. So you got like a kid sitting listening to a stereo a replacements album and then he goes up and he like kicks the speakers in. You know, and that was it. Three minutes of watching somebody listen to a stare listen to a song on a record player. But this is a great album. That's the thing. Just ignore the cover and play this record. Play this one. Play Let It Be, which is them sitting on a roof. Like the Beatles on a roof. Anyway, Let It Be. Great album. Pleased to meet me. Great album. Okay, enough of that. Um, okay, what have I got? I've got the Minutemen are next. The Minutemen from San Pedro, California. I got double nickels on the dime in 1984 after reading a Rolling Stone article calling Husker Du's Zen Arcade a punk quadrophenia. And then they also did a review of the Minutemen double nickels because both were double albums. So double nickels is... Uh, a double album, and it's kind of linked together with the sound of a car starting up and driving on it. And double nickels on the dime means driving 55 miles an hour on the highway. On the dime, you're just driving the speed limit. That was in response to Sammy Hagar's I Can't Drive 55, which was new out at the time. So they were kind of saying, well, We'll drive 55 miles an hour if you can't, but we'll have, you know, crazy music on the inside or something like that rather than be crazy with driving. It was their humor, which, you know, you look at the old labels for that album that I had, and you have the maximum speed limit 55, then you have the Minutemen logo, which uh, has San Pedro, California, and it has... Mike Watt's dad was in the Navy, so they used the anchor symbol a lot for, in honor of him. Um, and then it has pictures of them driving. It's got D. Boone there driving, George Hurley driving, and Watt. And the great thing about this picture of Watt, I mean, the van looks cool for one thing, because it's old fashioned car van thing. Um, and then if you look real hard, you see that the, uh, Exit sign is for San Pedro, it's because they're all about San Pedro. Um, I love the Minutemen. They're, uh, you know, a punk rock band that's not really a punk rock band. They're much more like a weird funk, jazzy, you know, political uh, beat poetry band or something. I mean, there's there's nothing like them. They're great. They're kind of a hard listen to begin with because they're not the most melodic singers. D's better than Mike Watt. <laughs> Mike Watt really can't sing, but he's a good writer. He's a fantastic bass player. And they were a trio. They are just, to me, one of the great power trios. Their documentary, um, We Jam Econo, is fantastic. One of the best documentaries on a punk rock band. So you should watch that. Okay, Minutemen. Um, e. Boone was also a painter. So these are some other covers that I love. Three-Way Tie for Last, where all their heads have been mounted. And it says things like Singer Activist, Annie War Sympathizer, Dude Local 357 underneath them as far as trophies from somebody who killed them and mounted them on the wall. Uh... Project Mersh, that D. Boone painting I love. Here's a Richard P Pettibone painting I also love. 
they had good album covers. So it's hard to pick a bad one. I mean, Punchline or whatever is kind of bland, but the one I'm going to pick is Ballot Result because it's a blurry photo. It's sad. That's why I'm picking that as my least favorite. What it was was they were in the process of making a live Greatest Hits, and they sent out um, a ballot to their fans saying, vote on what songs you want on this album. Then D. Boone was killed in a car crash, and uh, they took the results from the mail out and made a live album out of it. And it's a great album. This is a good introduction to them because it's some of their best songs all together in a live format. I mean, it's from a whole bunch of different sources, but it works well because their songs are short anyway, so they just power on through. But sad and to a great band that should have been more well-known. They were kind of just getting more and more commercial in a good way. And, you know, you knew that there were going to be some great albums coming up. So, um, yeah, then I'm down to my sixth choice right now, which is going to be the Jay Giles Band. I think Larry knows I'm a big Jay Giles fan. It's hard for me to pick a favorite album. Easier for me to pick a least favorite album. Um, I'm, well, I'd like to say The Morning After for a favorite album in a way, because I love this album. Um, and it's kind of a trashed room. It's very rock and roll, 1971 and black and white, and they're a kind of striking looking band. So the morning after a party, you can tell the television's been destroyed and furniture over here has been destroyed. And then they're off after staying in the hotel, waiting for the butt to get on the tour bus, which is pretty much what they did. They were tour, tour, tour forever and not get as much success till the very end. I like, one thing I like about this album is, uh, for one thing, the first two albums, they do a lot of covers, and Peter Wolf had incredible um, ability to pick great songs to cover because he was a record collector, R&B fanatic, um, and was really interested in a lot of kind of obscure bands. So one cover on here is by, or was uh, Dyke and the Blazers, and it was right after Dyke passed away that they covered this. So on this album, it says, In Memory of Dyke, Arlster Christian. Um, and that's So Sharp, which is one of my favorite Jay Giles covers. And this is the album with Looking for a Love, which was a Bobby Womack song, Bobby Womack's band, The Valentinos. So it's just tons of obscure songs. And they're maximum R&B. They really were kind of the American Rolling Stones. Those first two albums, I love. They're underrated albums. So I suggest people go find those Jay Giles albums. If you just know Centerfold and Freeze Frame, no, 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 go get those first two albums. Um, but they kind of plugged along on Atlantic, Atlantic Records and weren't able to get well-known, so... This was their first album on EMI, and to me, this is kind of the iconic cover. So this is probably my favorite Jay Giles cover, you know, the handprint. That's when the handprint logo came about, and I always like these photos on the back. This is kind of the last Jay Giles album before they did the new wave makeover, which I like Love Stinks and I like Freeze Frame, but... I've gotten to really like Sanctuary. Sanctuary's a great album. So, and it has incredible ballad uh, on it, Teresa. That's one of their best songs. And just some really good rock, too. So, okay, that one. I'm picking Ladies Invited for their worst cover. Now, this was actually, you might not believe it, this is a painting of um, uh, Wolf's um, wife at the time, uh, Faye Dunaway. They'd just gotten married, and he had a 
famous fashion illustrator Antonio do this painting. And it kind of has this weird, kind of cool, unique bunch of, you know, glamour heads with roses around. And then a pretty good picture of the band on the back. But I will say, this is another album cover that kept me from playing the album. And it's too bad, because this is one good album. You know, this is an album that's not a very immediate Jay Giles album. But it was their fourth album, fourth studio album. So it's right after Bloodshot. And I think a lot of the originals on here are some of their best. I think it's it's like the underrated uh, 70s Jay Giles album. Chimes, I think, is a little overdone. And that's there's a really good live version of that on um, Blow Your Face Out. But I think the rest of the album is really solid and funny and just rocks. So it's too bad it kind of had this glamour cover. I think that was a little excessive to make it all about Faye and Wolf, you know, because it kind of kind of wasn't what the band really was should have been about. Okay, that's my opinion, and I'll see you later in part two. Bye.